Part two of the Apology of Socrates by Plato, in the translation by Benjamin Jowett. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Father Ziley of Detroit, Michigan, June 2007. The Apology of Socrates by Plato. Translated by Benjamin Jowett, Part 2. There is another thing. Young men of the richer classes, who have not much to do, come about me of their own accord. They like to hear the pretenders examined, and they often imitate me and examine others themselves. There are plenty of persons, as they soon enough discover, who think that they know something, but really little or nothing. And then those who are examined by them, instead of being angry with themselves, are angry with me. This confounded Socrates, they say, this villainous misleader of youth. And then if somebody asks them, why, what evil does he practice or teach? They do not know, and cannot tell. But in order that they may not appear to be at a loss, they repeat the ready-made charges which are used against all philosophers about teaching things up in the clouds and under the earth and having no gods and making the worse appear the better cause. For they do not like to confess that their pretense of knowledge has been detected, which is the truth. And as they are numerous and ambitious and energetic, and are all in battle array, and have persuasive tongues, they have filled your ears with their loud and inveterate calumnies. And this is the reason why my three accusers, Miletus, Anitus, and Lycon, have set upon me. Miletus, who has a quarrel with me on behalf of the poets, Anitus, on behalf of the craftsmen, Lycon, on behalf of the rhetoricians, and as I said at the beginning, I cannot expect to get rid of this mass of calumny in a moment. And this, O men of Athens, is the truth, and the whole truth. I have concealed nothing. I have dissembled nothing. And yet I know that this plainness of speech makes them hate me. And what is their hate but a proof that I am speaking the truth? This is the occasion and reason of their slander of me, as you will find out either in this or in any future inquiry. I have said enough in my defense against the first class of my accusers. I turn to the second class, who are headed by Miletus, that good and patriotic man, as he calls himself. And now I will try to defend myself against him. These new accusers must also have their affidavit read. What do they say? Something of this. That Socrates is a doer of evil, and corrupter of the youth. That he does not believe in the gods of the state, and has other new divinities of his own. That is the sort of charge. And now let us examine the particular counts. He says that I am a doer of evil, who corrupt the youth. But I say, O men of Athens, that Miletus is a doer of evil, and the evil is that he makes a joke of a serious matter, and is too ready at bringing other men to trial from a pretended zeal and interest about matters in which he really never had the smallest interest. And the truth of this I will endeavor to prove. Come hither, Miletus, and let me ask a question of you. You think a great deal about the improvement of youth. Yes, I do. Tell the judges, then, who is their improver, for you must know, as you have taken the pains to discover their corrupter, and are citing and accusing me before them. Speak, then, and tell the judges who their improver is. Observe, Miletus, that you are silent and have nothing to say. But is not this rather disgraceful, and a very considerable proof of what I was saying? that you have no interest in the matter? Speak up, friend, and tell us who their improver is. The laws. But that, my good sir, is not my meaning. 
I want to know who the person is who in the first place knows the laws, the judges, Socrates, who are present in court. What do you mean to say, Miletus, that they are able to instruct and improve youth? Certainly they are. What, all of them, or some only, and not others? All of them. By the goddess Hera, that is good news. There are plenty of improvers, then. And what do you say of the audience? Do they improve them? Yes, they do. And the senators? Yes, the senators improve them. But perhaps the ecclesiasts corrupt them, or do they improve them? They improve them. Then every Athenian improves and elevates them all with the exception of myself, and I alone am their corrupter. Is that what you affirm? That is what I stoutly affirm. I am very unfortunate if that is true. But suppose I ask you a question. Would you say that this also holds true in the case of horses? Does one man do them harm and all the world good? Is not the exact opposite of this true? One man is able to do them good, or at least not many. The trainer of horses, that is to say, does them good, and others who have to do with them rather injure them. Is not that true, Miletus, of horses, or any other animals? Yes, certainly. Whether you and Anatus say yes or no, that is no matter. Happy indeed would be the condition of youth if they had one corrupter only, and all the rest of the world were their improvers. And you, Miletus, have sufficiently shown that you never had a thought about the young. Your carelessness is seen in your not caring about matters spoken of in this very indictment. And now, Miletus, I must ask you another question. Which is better, to live among bad citizens or among good ones? Answer, friend, I say. For well, that is a question which may be easily answered. Do not the good do their neighbors good, and the bad do them evil? Certainly. And is there anyone who would rather be injured than benefited by those who live with them? Answer, my good friend. The law requires you to answer. Does anyone like to be injured? Certainly not. And when you accuse me of corrupting and deteriorating the youth, do you allege that I corrupt them intentionally or unintentionally? Intentionally, I say. But you have just admitted that the good do their neighbors good, and the evil do them harm. Now, is that a truth which your superior wisdom has recognized thus early in life? And am I, at my age, in such darkness and ignorance, as not to know that if a man with whom I have to live is corrupted by me, I am very likely to be harmed by him, and yet I corrupt him, and intentionally too? That is what you are saying. And of that you will never persuade me, nor any other human being. But either I do not corrupt them, or I corrupt them unintentionally, so that on either view of the case you lie. If my offense is unintentional, the law has no cognizance of unintentional offenses. You ought to have taken me privately, and warned and admonished me. For if I had been better advised, I should have left off doing what I only did unintentionally. No doubt I should. Whereas you hated to converse with me, or teach me, but you indicted me in this court, which is a place not of instruction, but of punishment. I have shown, Athenians, as I was saying, that Miletus has no care at all, great or small, about the matter. But still, I should like to know, Miletus, in what I am affirmed to corrupt the youth. I suppose you mean, as I infer from your indictment, that I teach them not to acknowledge the gods which the state acknowledges, but some other new divinities or spiritual agencies in their stead. These are the lessons which corrupt the youth, as you say. Yes, that I say emphatically. Then by the gods, Miletus, of whom we are speaking, Tell me, and the court, in somewhat plainer terms, what you mean. For I do not as yet understand whether you affirm that I teach others to acknowledge some gods, and therefore do believe in gods, and am not an entire atheist. This you do not lay to my charge, but only that they are not the same gods which the city recognizes. 
the charge is that they are different gods? Or do you mean to say that I am an atheist simply, and a teacher of atheism? I mean the latter, that you are a complete atheist. That is an extraordinary statement, Miletus. Why do you say that? Do you mean that I do not believe in the godhead of the sun or moon, which is the common creed of all men? I assure you, judges, that he does not believe in them, for he says that the sun is stone and the moon earth. Friend Miletus, you think you are accusing Anaxagoras, and you have put but a bad opinion of the judges if you fancy them ignorant to such a degree as not to know that those doctrines are found in the books of Anaxagoras and Clazomenia, who is full of them. And these are the doctrines which the youth are said to learn of Socrates, when there are not unfrequently exhibitions of them at the theater, price of admission one drachma at the most, and they might cheaply purchase them, and laugh at Socrates if he pretends to father such eccentricities. And so, Miletus, you really think that I do not believe in any god? I swear by Zeus that you believe absolutely in none at all. You are a liar, Miletus, not believed even by yourself. For I cannot help thinking, O men of Athens, that Miletus is reckless and impudent and that he has written this indictment in a spirit of mere wantonness and youthful bravado. Has he not compounded a riddle, thinking to try me? He said to himself, I shall see whether this wise Socrates will discover my ingenious contradiction, or whether I shall be able to deceive him and the rest of them. For he certainly does appear to me to contradict himself in the indictment as much as if he said that Socrates is guilty of not believing in the gods, and yet of believing in them. But this surely is a piece of fun. I should like you, O men of Athens, to join me in examining what I conceive to be his inconsistency. And to you, Oletus, answer. And I must remind you that you are not to interrupt me if I speak in my accustomed manner. Did ever man, Miletus, believe in the existence of human things and not of human beings? I wish, men of Athens, that he would answer and not be always trying to get up an interruption. Did ever any man believe in horsemanship and not in horses, or in flute playing and not in flute players? No, my friend, I will answer to you and to the court as you refuse to answer for yourself. There is no man who ever did. But now, please, to answer the next question. Can a man believe in spiritual and divine agencies and not in spirits or demigods? He cannot. I am glad that I have extracted that answer by the assistance of the court. Nevertheless, you swear in the indictment that I teach and believe in divine or spiritual agencies, new or old, no matter for that at any rate, I believe in spiritual agencies, as you say and swear in the affidavit. But if I believe in divine beings, I must believe in spirits or demigods. Is not that true? Yes, that is true, for I may assume that your silence gives assent to that. Now, what are spirits or demigods? Are they not either gods or the sons of gods? Is that true? Yes, that is true. But this is just the ingenious riddle of which I was speaking. The demigods or spirits are gods, and you say first that I don't believe in gods, and then again that I do believe in gods, that is, if I believe in demigods. For if the demigods are the illegitimate sons of gods, whether by the nymphs or by any other mothers, as is thought, that, as all men will allow, necessarily implies the existence of their parents you might as well affirm the existence of mules and deny that of horses and asses. Such nonsense, Miletus, could only have been intended by you as a trial of me. You have put this into the indictment because you had nothing real of which to accuse me. But no one who has a particle of understanding will ever be convinced by you that the same man can believe in divine and superhuman things and yet not believe that there are gods and demigods and heroes. I have said enough in answer to the charge of Miletus. Any elaborate defense is unnecessary. But as I was saying before, I certainly have many enemies, 
and this is what will be my destruction if I am destroyed. Of that I am certain. Not Miletus, nor yet Anitus, but the envy and detraction of the world, which has been the death of many good men, and will probably be the death of many more. There is no danger of my being the last of them. Someone will say, Are you not ashamed, Socrates, of a course of life which is likely to bring you to an untimely end? To him I may fairly answer, There you are mistaken. A man who is good for anything ought not to calculate the chance of living or dying. He ought only to consider whether in doing anything he is doing right or wrong acting the part of a good man or of a bad. Whereas, according to your view, the heroes who fell at Troy were not good for much, and the son of Thetis, above all, who altogether despised danger in comparison with disgrace, and when his goddess mother said to him in his eagerness to slay Hector, that if he avenged his companion Patroclus and slew Hector, he would die himself, fate, as she said, waits upon you next after Hector. He, hearing this, utterly despised danger and death, and instead of fearing them, feared rather to live in dishonor and not to avenge his friend. Let me die next, he replies, and be avenged of my enemy rather than abide here by the beaked ships, a scorn and a burden of the earth. Had Achilles any thought of death and danger? For wherever a man's place is, whether the place which he has chosen or that in which he has been placed by a commander, there he ought to remain in the hour of danger. He should not think of death or of anything but of disgrace. And this, O men of Athens, is a true saying. Strange indeed would be my conduct, O men of Athens, if I who, when I was ordered by the generals whom you chose to command me at Potidaea and Amphipolis and Delium, remained where they placed me, like any other man facing death, if, I say now, when, as I conceive and imagine, God orders me to fulfill the philosopher's mission of searching into myself and other men, I were to desert my post through fear of death, or any other fear. That would indeed be strange, and I might justly be arraigned in court for denying the existence of the gods, if I disobeyed the oracle because I was afraid of death. Then I should be fancying that I was wise when I was not wise. For this fear of death is indeed the pretense of wisdom, and not real wisdom, being the appearance of knowing the unknown, since no one knows whether death, which they in their fear apprehend to be the greatest evil, may not be the greatest good. Is there not here conceit of knowledge which is a disgraceful sort of ignorance? And this is the point in which, as I think, I am superior to men in general, and in which I might perhaps fancy myself wiser than other men, that whereas I know but little of the work below, I do not suppose that I know, but I do know that injustice and disobedience to a better, whether God or man, is evil and dishonorable, and I will never fear or avoid a possible good rather than a certain evil. And therefore, if you let me go now and reject the counsels of Anatus, who said that if I were not put to death, I ought not to have been prosecuted, and that if I escape now, your sons will all be utterly ruined by listening to my words. If you say to me, Socrates, this time we will not mind Anatus, and will let you off, but upon one condition, that you are not to inquire and speculate in this way any more, and that if you are caught doing this again, you shall die. If this was the condition on which you let me go, I should reply, Men of Athens, I honor and love you, but I shall obey God rather than you, and while I have life and strength, I shall never cease from the practice and teaching of philosophy, exhorting anyone whom I meet after my manner, and convincing him, saying, O oh my friend, why do you who are a citizen of the great and mighty and wise city of Athens care so much about laying up the greatest amount of money and honor and reputation? and so little about wisdom and truth and the greatest improvement of the soul, which you never regard or heed at all. Are you not ashamed of this? And if the person with whom I am arguing says, Yes, but I do care, I do not depart or let him go at once. I interrogate and examine and cross-examine him, 
and if I think that he has no virtue, but only says that he has, I reproach him with undervaluing the greater and overvaluing the less. And this I should say to everyone whom I meet, young and old, citizen and alien, but especially to the citizens, inasmuch as they are my brethren. For this is the command of God, as I would have you know. And I believe that to this day no greater good has ever happened in the state than my service to the God. For I do nothing but go about persuading you all, old and young alike, not to take thought for your persons and your properties, but first and chiefly to care about the greatest improvement of the soul. I tell you that virtue is not given by money, but that from virtue come money and every other good of man, public as well as private. This is my teaching, and if this is the doctrine which corrupts the youth, my influence is ruinous indeed. But if anyone says that this is not my teaching, he is speaking in untruth. Wherefore, O men of Athens, I say to you, do as Anatus bids, or not as Anatus bids, and either acquit me or not. But whatever you do, know that I shall never alter my ways not even if I have to die many times. End of part two of the Apology of Socrates by Plato in the translation by Benjamin Jowett. Recording by Father Ziley, Detroit, Michigan.